día, eh, bienvenidas, bienvenidos a... Good morning, welcome everyone to this table of the colloquium. Eh, damos la cordial bienvenida a quienes eh, nos están... We are just uh, letting uh, people in. Welcome everyone who is here on, on the session, on the Zoom session, and everyone who's listening outside of Zoom. Uh, before starting... I, I would like to thank well, everyone for being here and well, Guillermo and the technical and people from the technical configurations for their help. I want to tell you that unfortunately, Susana Berkovic is not going to be attending. She's uh, having a complicated uh, uh, time with her son so we just wish her the best so that everything gets better very soon so we will now uh, have uh, the table just with uh, gary and sergio villalobos ruminot two of the colleagues from uh, 17 most of you know them So I will start uh, presenting them. So we will be talking about different uh, topics about perspex per perspectives and uh, configurations for the future. I will Gary Hall is going to be uh, presenting first. Uh, Gary Hall is a critical theorist and philosopher of the media. He works in areas of digital culture, politics, and technology. Uh, he's a professor at the Coventry University in UK where he's in charge of a uh, center of digital culture, a place that brings together theorists, professionals, advocates, and media artists, uh, author of various books such as uh, A Servant Fury, How to Write uh, Works in Elitist Britain, The Inhumanist Manifesto, uh, published in 2017, Pirate Philosophy of 2016, and uh, EU Verification, of the university in 2016. Welcome, Gary. And after the presentation of Gary, I will present uh, Sergio Villalobos. So apparently you can start, Gary. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Let's hope this has worked. So. Let's try this one. Okay. We can see that. All good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, oh, no. There we go. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be here. Very happy to help continue the celebrations of 17 turning uh, 20. Uh, very nice to be part of that. Um, I think this is uh, the third presentation I've given for you over the, the course of the last uh, year or so. Uh, all of them putting 17 in perspective and providing some figurations and or outlines for the future. Um, so those that you were there, Remember your economic imagination colloquium back in June 2021, together with three of my colleagues from Coventry, Yannicka Adema, Mel Jordan and Adie Evans. I offered you a bit of a taster of some of the research we've been doing in the Centre for Post-Digital Cultures. And specifically, uh, we looked at our work on experimental publishing, on art in the public sphere and on subject on subjectivity, gender, and sexuality. So our center at Coventry 
only launched in 2017, so uh, we're, we're much, much younger than 17. However, we do have some shared intellectual origins, as some of you will know. Benjamin and I both studied critical theory at the UK's University of Sussex in the late 1980s, early 1990s. So it's perhaps not so very surprising that the two of us, uh, the two of us have both ended up experimenting with making and unmaking institutions. Well, of course, we're operating very different economic, cultural and political situations. Then in January of this year for the dispositifs of mutual, mutuality colloquium, well, our original idea for that was for Benjamin and I to have a, a mutual discussion about our respective uh, counter-institutional projects. However, uh, it became clear that Benjamin was going to be presenting for a few hours prior to when we were on the bill. So he asked me to begin by talking about some of the collaborative critical theory projects or dispositifs, as Benjamin likes to think of them, that I've been involved with over the years. As you can see, there, there are quite a lot and they form something of a critical archipelago of their own. We then aligned these initiatives with the archipelago Benjamin has been involved in making. And obviously this includes 17, as well as the floating market, the mutual social network and the critical switch platform. Now, often when I talk about the collaborative projects I'm involved with, I focus on one or two in, in detail. However, back in January, Benjamin asked me to provide you with more of an overview of the, the critical archipelago that I've helped to create, a, more of a kind of a map or a chart, as it were, which is what I did. And I began by making some orienting points for this map. And the first of these is that these world-making projects are about making many worlds, so a uh, pluriverse. Uh, if you like, rather than the universalism of Western liberal modernity. And the second point is that these projects are performative in that they're concerned not just with representing multiple worlds, they're also concerned with interacting with them in order to do things within and as part of these worlds. So you could also think of this as, as being prefigurative in a way. We're trying to be the change that we want to, to see. So we might indeed think of some of them as dispositifs or concrete social apparatuses, if we wanted to borrow the language of Foucault and Deleuze and Agamben. The third point is that, as Chantal Mouffe emphasizes, the striated nature, nature of the globalized space in which there's a multiplicity of sites where relations of power are articulated in specific local, regional, regional and national configurations. That means what's required is a, a variety of strategies. So for my collaborators and I, as for Jack Doda here, then it's necessary in each situation to create an appropriate mode of expression to invent the law of the singular event, to take account of the presumed or desired addressee, which is one reason we've ended up making an archipelago too. And the fourth and final point, kind of orienting point that I started with, is that this means that our theory performances constitute a plurality of forms of intervention that respond to specific issues across a number of different sites. So not only higher education, but also the worlds of art, activism, business, politics, technology, and the media. So we're theorists, but our performances of theory might all, not always take the form of a piece of writing or the publication of a book. They can also be sometimes a business, a collective, a journal, an institution. 
And what I'm going to do today is just concentrate on the project. I ended my map with back in January to say a little bit more about that in detail, because that's the newest, if you like. And this is that concerned with reprogramming the city. And one of our aims with our archipelago of collaborative projects is to disarticulate the existing cultural playing field. It's manufactured common sense, what Gayatri Spivak would think of as habits. And instead, we want to foster a variety of antagonistic spaces, both inside and outside of capital, of states, and of institutions. Spaces that are neither simply liberal nor neoliberal, and that can contribute to the development of a variety of critically oriented count institutions and communities. And for us, this is very much the point of institutions such as 17, and our own centre for post-digital cultures. It's the point of these institutions. It's also to act. We see them as spaces to act as a test site for the development of new social relations and new knowledges, new practices, even new subjectivities. The kind of thing that's often hard to explore elsewhere. That's what you can do in these kind of institutions. But even more than that, you can, as well as testing them, you can also help actualize such new relations and knowledges and practices and subjectivities. Now, collaborative dispositivists can do so. They can do, in, do so in places that are traditionally associated with the modernist, liberal, white male space that is the Euro Western University. Hence, our interest in re, our interest in reinventing elements of institutional infrastructure, especially those that are involved in the production and dissemination of theory. Since, like many of you, a lot of us do identify as being theorists. So books and journals and pamphlets, presses, lectures, seminars, conferences, even the very gestures of reading and writing. So I'm thinking of processual texts, you know, the processual texts of Open Humanities Press's two liquid and living book series here on the left, or even the free art collectives uh, and my colleague Mel Jordan's involved in this, three art collectors' choral reworking of pre-existing manifestos, as you can see on the right. But institutions such as ours can also help to actualize new knowledges and social relations, not just in higher education, but in the public sphere too. That's why we're interested in placemaking and in being public. After all, one definition of publishing is making public. And that's something we understand as both making something available to the public to publish it, but it's also making the public. We're actually forming publics and communities. And I'm gonna loop back to that towards the end of what I have to say. But our interest in placemaking and being public also leads us to be involved in collaborating on the reimagining of things like galleries and libraries, archives and musician, museums, glam for short, and other elements of municipal infrastructure. We also have an interest in helping to build and develop and maintain and care for a wide variety of counter organizations and communities that help us to perform our subject, subjectivities and ways of being together along more anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-heteropatriarchal lines. With their emphasis on ontological relationality and interactive collaboration of both humans and non-humans, our projects are designed to help us engage in de-liberal humanizing our theory, our institutions, even our understanding of our own bodies. 
what some of us are working on now is the question, to what extent can the collaborative, performative, de-liberal humanizing approaches we've adopted with our critical archipelago of projects, to what extent can that be translated to cities to help transform them and the way we are as bodies in such public spaces? And the reason we're focusing on cities, the reason we're interested in cities, well, first, because they're particularly important places when it comes to progressive politics. It's hard to imagine societies differently without also imagining the spaces they occupy differently too. Secondly, we're interested in cities because it's in cities that political forces for change often emerge these days. Numerous events have testified to this in recent years, from the roundabout revolutions of Bahrain and South Korea, through Occupy Wall Street, and the movements of the squares in Spain and Greece, to the 2020 anti-racist insurgencies, and more recent pro-democracy actions in Hong Kong here. A third reason cities are important when it comes to politics is because they operate at a scale that makes progressive change in a leftist sense, a realistic possibility. Being smaller, and in the case of the UK, less subject to the attentions of the conservative national media, it's often far easier for towns and cities to adopt a radical and experimental approach than it is for nation states. So a lot of the initial impetus behind the Arab Spring, 15M, Occupy and Occupy Getty protests sub subsequently went into municipalism for just this reason. Similarly, local political leaders, such as the mayor of Manchester in the UK here, Andy Burnham, and to a lesser extent, London mayor, Sadiq Khan, they're not engaging in large scale mainstream politics on a national stage so much. They're focused more on providing smaller scale government at a local level. And this means that to offer something different to the status quo, they don't have to wait for a sympathetic government to be elected. Their attitude is more the independent one of taking action without waiting for permission or guidance from above or from government at the center. At the same time, cities today face many problems. These problems include war, poverty, unemployment, population density, racist state violence, labor exploitation, violence against women or female identifying female presenting people and climate breakdown. Since 2010, Britain has closed approximately 800 of its public libraries, which is almost a fifth of the total. Nearly 130 libraries were shut in 2018 alone. And more closures are expected to follow in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. It's a policy of reducing spending on local civic infrastructure and amenities that over the years has left the path clear for private providers to enter spaces that have long been considered the domain of the public sector. For example, the UK government, under cover of the pandemic, has been looking to scrape all doctors' data from people's medical records and make them available for sale to corporations. Indeed, data analytics company Palantir Technologies, which is founded by Peter Thiel in 2004 and has been backed by the CIA's venture capital arm, it's currently looking to become the data operating system for the UK's National Health Service. If it's awarded the 360 million five-year contract it's aiming for, 
Palantir will have access to the personal health data of millions of us in the UK. Meanwhile, not only is Amazon, which bills itself as Earth's biggest bookstore, replaced public libraries and bookshops in many cities, its introduction of sidewalk is also turning its echo speakers and ring security cameras into a shared wireless network. This creating citywide mesh networks and a lot of concern over data privacy and security. So as a result of all this, the makeup of cities is shifting from public institutions such as the post office and public library to the deregulated cloud computing infrastructure and casualized employment practices of private for-profit companies such as Google and Amazon. And of course, there's already been a lot of criticism of this shift. In May 2020, Naomi Klein reported that Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, was due to head up a commission to reimagine New York State's post-COVID reality, with an emphasis on permanently integrating AI, mass surveillance, and data collection technology into every aspect of civic life. Klein identifies in such arrangements the beginnings of an extremely profitable vision of the future. At its heart lies a seamless integration of government with a handful of Silicon Valley giants, with public schools, hospitals, police, and military, all outsourcing at high cost, many of their core functions to private tech companies. Meanwhile, in their 2019 book, How to Run a City Like Amazon and Other Fables, Shannon Matten, Mark Graham and their co-authors imagine just how bad it would actually be to live and work in a city run by hyper-capitalist companies such as Amazon, Uber and Deliveroo, with their emphasis on precarity, mass surveillance and behavioural control. Yet while criticizing the future direction in which cities are headed can be extremely satisfying, my collaborators and I don't want to leave it at that. We want to see if we can go even further than some of these critical approaches from Klein, Matten and, and Co. Taking our inspiration in part from the celebrated community wealth building model, dubbed guerrilla localism, that's been pioneered by Preston City Council in the UK, which is based on the collective economic and social power of the city's public institutions, not to mention the self-organized networks of mutual care that emerged in the early days of the pandemic in many places around the world. We want to look toward what we do want when it comes to the future of cities, not just what we don't. As a provocation to rad radically reimagine our cities and towns along more entangled, relational, processual, that is, non modernist liberal lines, we want to see the disruption created by deindustrialization, the financial crisis, Trump, Brexit, coronavirus pandemic, and now war in Ukraine, is providing us with an opportunity to extend a challenge to both the private and public paradigms as they currently exist. Because of course, we can't go back to the world of public institutions that flourished in the 19th and 20th centuries. As I'm conscious you're very aware in, in Mexico, we need to rethink the public paradigm too, not just the private. The way my colleagues and I want to do so is by examining how the plurivisal, collaborative, performative approaches we've developed with initiatives such as Open Humanities Press and Radical Open Access Collective and so on, how they can provide inspiring, 
but also relatively easily cheap and flexible possibilities for radically rethink, re rethinking cities and their infrastructure. So they are fit for purpose in the age of AI, and algorithms, and data analytics. Oh, sorry, I've got a cuckoo clock, so it goes off. Uh, just be thankful it's not 12 o'clock. It goes on for a while then. Uh, specifically, we want to explore how offering a diverse repertoire of more horizontal and commons-oriented alternatives to those galleries and libraries and museums currently being provided by the state and corporate realms, how they can help to reshape cities, conceptually, but practically and concretely too. For example, can we build on the experience that we and our various collaborators have with our own critical archipelago of open access publishers, shadow pirate libraries, DIY pop-up exhibitions and so, so forth? A starting point for this would be the various hardware, software, tools and collections that have been made widely available by advocates of open access, open glam, free, libre, open source software, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, copy file F piracy, and the anti-privatized knowledge commons, a whole list of movements that have been making hardware and software and tools and collections open. Can we make it possible for the inhabit inhabitants of cities to be able to select from these resources? and create their own bespoke, anti-capitalist, anti-racist, or anti-heteropatriarchal cultural institutions on a more self-organizing basis. The idea would be for a multiplicity of actors to be able to do so, according to the needs and requirements of their specific situations, either by copying them more or less as they are, or by developing, modifying, repurposing those elements they want and discarding the rest. Or this could then be fed into either an informal, flexible, latent commons, or a more formal distributed union or federation of open city infrastructure. And so made available to be critically and creatively reused, misused and abused by others in turn. In keeping with the approaches of Open Humanities Press and the Radical Open Access Collective, the building of such beasts or counter institutions will be done in a non rivalness non-competitive fashion to collaboratively proliferate experiments with reimagining the city. As with those projects, the emphasis will not be on scaling up or scaling out any one open city model for the creation of such free and open civic resources. Rather, the kind of scaling small approach some of my collaborators have de detailed elsewhere would be used to develop potentially transformative intergroup relationships with a diversity of human and non human others. And we mentioned the, the non human here because ours is a relational, processual, in other words, non modernist liberal communism that includes the non-human. So the city in this conception would not be concerned with growth or expansion in the conventional sense. Nor would, be, would it be organized in terms of a center periphery or inside outside model, be the latter the suburbs, the countryside or nature. Rather by allowing tools, content, systems and infrastructure to be copied and shared and reiterated free of charge, it would non-scale or scale small through the establishment of collaborative relations of co-creation and custodianship between a variety of widely distributed communities. In this way, an extended multipolarity or archipelago of disparate projects and initiatives would be cultivated. 
And I emphasize disparate because there are many kinds of cities. The appropriate combination and mixture of principles and protocols, tools and infrastructure, priorities and resources would therefore differ from location to location, municipality to municipality, time to time, and will be highly situated and site sensitive, materially, ecologically, culturally, politically. According to what we might call a stance of responsible openness, it would include the possibility of some communities refusing to make their tools and infrastructure openly available, instead keeping them closed, hidden, secret. Now, I'm making this point under the influence of the, the feminist group Feminismo Commutario. They see the refusal of translation and with it the kind of decontextualized connection that can be achieved when their writings are not accessed in their original Spanish as a way of refusing extractive, extractivist power relations and keeping English only speaking actors, keeping them at the margins. So this is not about trying to provide a uniform one size fits all model. Nor what Matthew Brown and Rian Jones described as a blueprint for universalizable localism. If anything, what we're looking toward would be closer to a pluriversalizable localism. Even within what any one city, there will be a messy plurality of actors, groups, movements, organizations, and institutions, all rooted in specific places with their different histories, experiences, and expectations and all best engaged with the involvement of those who are dealing with them on a regular basis. So as you can see, ours is a very different approach to the city than that we're perhaps familiar with from architecture and from urban planning. We're not talking about an equivalent to the smooth, smart city here. Without an iperetic opening to the stupid, the rough, dirty, humble, impure, disordered and dysfunctional, cities are boring and antiseptic at best. For example, despite, despite the emphasis on digital technologies, open source software and so forth, none of this is to suggest cities should no longer have room for all style public libraries. For one thing, public libraries are enclosed, warm, well-lit spaces in which people can remain for long periods of time in order to think and study for free. The universities of the streets, as the poet Benjamin Zephaniah calls them. For another, public libraries can serve as an important role they can serve an important role as alternative community centers for the very young, the very old, the disabled, unemployed, and otherwise socially marginalized. But I'm also referring to the example of the public library because it's a good illustration of how the inhabitants of a city often use its infrastructure differently from the ways in which it's imagined they might. Learning from this lesson, I'm deliberately leaving my sketch of how to build a Leighton Commons or federated community of open cities loose and unfinished. It's important that it remain adaptable and flexible enough for others to be able to complete it. Although it's never actually going to be complete, but for others to be able to complete it by mutating it in unpredictable ways according to their particular needs and circumstances. 
Not every detail needs to be planned or designed. Some, some things can be left to chance. It's vital cities remain hospitable to the useless and unproductive, including the disadvantaged, the disempowered, the disaffected. But also they need to remain hospitable to the strange, the surprising, the weird. And the latter includes the notion that non-human species and other actors and elements, buildings, technologies, and so forth, can actively participate in the creation of cities. So in this respect, it's important to recognize that the multiplicity of actors that we want to help to create their own baseball culture institutions, that multiplicity does not already exist. So there's a, a pre-given civic population or pre-understood and pre-defined public. And coming back to that notion of publishing as you know, making public, making the public. These are missing communities and the missing publics that have to be made. And what we're doing, what we're doing with our archipelago of projects is we're endeavoring to invent the new contexts out of which these multiplicities, these new pub publics and missing communities out of which they can emerge. And that's, it's inventing the new context. That's where our interest in cities comes in. Although we'd say the same about them too. There's no blueprint for the cities we're looking to create. They don't already exist, not even in our imaginations. They're missing cities. Cities that need to be called forth in different ways and times and places. And that needs to be done artistically, practically, theoretically. In short, we need to keep the question of the city and its inhabitants aporetically open. It's not decided in advance. It has to be enacted and performed in specific situations. All of which means that the outline or figuration or prefiguration of how to build a latent commons or federated community of open cities that I've provided this morning, that should be seen less as a model and more as an aspiration or horizon for us to navigate or, or sail towards. The idea is to cultivate the kind of meaningful diversity when it comes to the development of self-governing, democratically managed and controlled, community-owned initiatives, the kind of diversity that might actually change things, which is how Anna Singh defines non-scaling as a diversity that might actually change things rather than scaling, which just repeats the same thing, just makes it larger. Such a non-scaling approach would this add to the pluralistic menu of ideas for transforming existing cultural, economic, and social relations that are already being explored in places, various places around the world including Preston, Froome and North Ayrshire in the UK, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, New York, San Francisco and Cleveland, Ohio in the US, and Barcelona and Madrid in the Basque region in Spain. According to Brown and Jones, for example, the UK already has over 7,000 cooperative enterprises while around the world, approximately 1 billion people in 96 countries have become members of at least one cooperative. In addition to worker-owned cooperatives, including platform cooperatives, this living repertoire or critical archipelago 
takes in municipal socialism, or sanctuary and solidarity cities, community wealth building, mutually owned businesses, social and socially conscious enterprises, mutual care networks, credit unions, people's banks, and community land trusts. Of course, it almost goes without saying that there's lots more to be worked out here. I'm going to leave that for another time. Just to suffice to say that this is where higher education institutions and centres such as 17 and post-digital cultures come in. These are important when it comes to thinking about the post-pandemic future of society. Because along with things like councils and hospitals and trade unions and housing associations, they can act as what's called anchor institutions. These are institutions that have a critical and a crucial, stable presence in a place because they often have long historical associations with it and ties to it, because they employ a certain amount of people, because they might buy certain amounts of goods and services, or even on occasion they might own a lot of buildings and land. This is important because for alternative organisations and ent entities and communities to grow and survive, they often need the long-term support of a stable anchor institution if they are to work out the various interrelated legal and financial and organisational challenge that are associated with providing a situated local alternative to, say, Silicon Valley and its platforms and screen New Deal. The kind of support that will enable them to tackle this change uh, of culture and a way of being together that will enable them to do this. And what's more, not just survive financially or economically, but also have space and time for sustained risk-taking and experimentation. And that's precisely why I see uh, institutions organisations, entities such as 17 as being uh, so important to all this. I'm going to end there. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you again for inviting me. I look forward to discussions and questions. I'll just stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thanks a lot, Gary, for this presentation. I loved how you went from a macro dimension and then get into a discussion of organizations. And I was wondering, maybe this will be for uh, after a presentation of Sergio, uh, of the role of 17 within this uh, city, that it's like a digital city considering that after the pandemic, 17 uh, sort of closed the offices, the physical offices in, in the city. So maybe we should wonder how this past university uh, remains latent in the houses of the people who are in charge of maintaining 17 alive in the houses of the students. I mean, that maybe this is a question for later on. I would like to just uh, continue with our next, uh, I mean, he's a, he's a friend, Sergio uh, Villalobos Ruminot. Uh, very briefly, I'm going to explain his curriculum. He's a professor of Latin American studies at the University of Michigan in the United States. He's a sociologist and philosopher, graduated from the University of Chile and a PhD in Latin American literature at the University of Pittsburgh. Among his publications, uh, we have Pending Sovereignties, Imagination and Violence in Latin America, uh, Ethnographies of Violence, History, Nihilism and Destruction from 2016. And this articulation this articulation, epochality, hege hegemony, and uh, antagonism uh, of 2019. He also made some uh, publications of Ernesto Laclau, uh, Hegemony and Antagonism, 
uh, that was published in 2002. He has translated some works of John Beverly, Subalternism and Representation, Arguments in Cultural Theory, that was in 2003, and Politics of Theory, Essays for of Subalternity and Hegemony in 2011. He has also translated uh, William Spanus, Crisis of Occidental Humanism, of Western Humanism, among his last publications, we have Myth, Destruction, and Revolt, Notes on Fourier Jesse uh, of 2018, Dirty Communism of 2018, About the Possibilities of, of a Savage Democracy, 2018, and Anarchy as a, as a Closure of Metaphysics, uh, Historicity, and Deco Deconstruction in the work of uh, Rainer Schurman of 2017. He currently teaches seminars on Marxism, populism, and indigenism in Latin America, uh, as well as seminars on migration and globalization. Welcome, Sergio. Thanks a lot, Beatrice, for the presentation. Thanks a lot, Gary, for your presentation. I am going to speak speak as a little slower so that the interpretation can be possible and so that Gary can listen to me. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to think of the context we are thinking about, about the projection, about critical thinking and uh, critical uh, practices. So what I will be doing is just giving a general overview to understand the, the contemporary transformation where this intellectual work is taking place. And I will try to make an approximation from there to what I call practices related to uh, dirty communism that it's uh, re directly related to reimagining and recommoning, re like defining again the common mediated, that it's now mediated by uh, private uh, corporations. And of course, I'm totally interested in thinking this from the point of view of transformation from the contemporary urban experience, especially because now working in Michigan, I'm very close to this uh, process of resistance and urban reimagining against uh, gentrification of Detroit. And also because I see this process in Mexico, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a uh, uh, a place, well, a space where we were imagining or we were talking about how we could reimagining and how the city will, how can the city could be reappropriated by the commons. In the case of Chile, in 2019, with all this revolt that transformed radically what we could call the homogeneous time of the modernization of the neoliberal modernity that was so present at the time in Chile. I would basically say that nowadays we are on a historical moment where we are creating uh, an experience. We are so tired of the paradigm of the of the modernity. This political this political modernity, in terms of its concepts and institutions, is now becoming it, it's, it's it's becoming worn out. It's uh, I mean worn out in terms of its uh, fundamentals, the representation of the human, and of course all of this. Uh, has an impact, a radical impact on how we think uh, the relationship between a uh, practice and theory, and uh, university and the public. But if on one hand we can identify this internal architecture to uh, make reference of Kant and the architecture of reason, if we think about this exhaustion, uh, uh, what Carlos Galli has called and characterized as uh, architectural nihilism. Architectural nihilism means that we no longer have a conceptual architecture that can organize the factuality of the world. We have made, uh, or we're living this uh, exhaustion or depletion of the current uh, organization and the depletion of the distinctive division uh, of, of work, distinctive uh, university of, of, of thought. 
but along with this depletion this internal depletion uh, of the of the way of thinking we are now experiencing a symptomatic or an external depletion of this uh, uh, political modernity of course this is linked with what we called the uh, agreements of Bretton Woods in 1972 uh, with the government of Nixon and this gives this gave place to the deregulation of the economy and the transformation between capital the relationship between capital and sovereignty uh, which is what we call neoliberalism or, or neoliberalization this neoliberalism which could also be characterized as subsunction or a final uh, that has to do with the history of capital in, in terms of, of Marxism is expressed in a series of situation uh, of devastating situations such as the pandemic, the increase of uh, security paradigms, the uh, attentional economies that are even more complex in terms of extraction of plus, uh, Uh, of capital gains, of surplus uh, value, also the performative practice of capitalism. Uh, now that we have war as, as a, a priori condition, as a necessary condition to put into practice the processes of appropriation or accumulation. And nowadays we notice that war is indeed a process of accumulation. It's not an external condition, it's a way of accumulation. And war uh, is not just a sovereign war uh, imagined by Schmid and Clausen. This is a diversification of intensities and ways of conflicts and wars. So in order to think the city, we need to think of all these urban wars that led to the creation of, pol uh, of the police, uh, racialization of security apparatus and uh, poly uh, violence from, the, from uh, the police. That's something that occurs also in Brazil, in Mexico, or violence against uh, black people in the United States. So if you notice, we are in a historical moment where this internal depletion of political modernism comes together with a series of crises that are no longer productive crises. The modern uh, concept of crisis is productive crisis. The idea that at certain point of the crisis, the process of a, a capitalist accumulation will come over the crisis and will start over a process of destructive. That was a productive destruction crisis of, as a productive de destruction. But what I'm saying is that along with the a depletion of uh, modernity. Now, crisis is no longer an element where production, where destru productive destruction is okay. It's just devastation. The infinite aim of capitalism has just reached a point where there's only devastation, and what's uh, in 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 place is the possibility of subsistence. And we are talking about the subsistence, not just of a city. We're talking about the subsistence or the survival of the planet. Now I'm going to focus on what happens uh, with uh, the university. In this horizon, uh, during the last 20 years or even before, the concept of a series of theoretical movements that are totally necessary, but also that are symptomatic of this situation. And I mean uh, post-colonial studies that are not the same as the movements from the 70s that were anti-colonialist movements. But, uh, like, for instance, these movements that come from India, Asia, Latin America. So there is a new paradigm that, that gives priority to the Western culture. So there is a perspective that moves towards uh, releasing the Western uh, part and moving away from it. So it's part of the development uh, of capitalism, but this post-colonial moment that comes from the 90s 
becomes uh, a radical and makes us think of a radical demarcation between uh, the West and the East and creates a political demarcation where the first and the third world are replaced by the idea of the global north and the south and the southern part of the world. And second, the, the, the force that these uh, movements uh, acquire when we talk about feminism and queer movements, and I'm not just talking about the historical reivindication or the recognition uh, of these movements. This is a reform on the question, uh, the core of uh, feminism or, or the queer uh, element. It can no longer be uh, taken into consideration from the representation, the question puts into place the very idea of representation on uh, the liberal democracies of the Western world. And regardless of the uh, uh, of the speeches of, of the universities, we need to respect. Uh, also, the, the feminism, the, this Hollywood feminism of Me Too is different from the workers from Detroit, uh, from Detroit. We are talking about different fights, a different uh, legitimacy, also the emergence of indigenous movements that are not, not only reacting uh, in their politics of pacification, indigenous movements uh, were always present, but nowadays they are uh, moving towards uh, emerging with a different force in terms that they are becoming part of this historical catastrophe from the point of view of uh, Amazonian. Uh, they are now facing a big historical catastrophe. They have already lived the end of history that we are so afraid of. And they are now living this history, this end of history again because they are living the end of their history, but also they're living the end of our history. This means thinking the geopolitics of Amazonia is not just thinking about the indigenous people, it's thinking about the circuits or were, that has to do with the devastation conducted by capitalism. So the effects that we are seeing on Amazonia is not affecting just the 11 spaces of this uh, of this country. They affect us at a global scale. From there, we could add also the emergence of the black studies and uh, uh, black uh, activism and activism, not just in terms of Black Lives Matter or that kind of movements. Also the emergence of the parading of black operative and Afro-pessimism, especially because Afro-pessimism brings back this question of uh, Black radical uh, fights, the, the limits of uh, Western anthropology. That is the definition of what's human in the Western uh, way of thinking. And, and I, that makes me think of Kant uh, about observations of the beauty and the sublime that led us to think of certain uh, people as subhumans, as not being completely human. So this re re even like moving against these uh, paradigms that deny the structure, not only political denial, which could be corrected with abolitionism or a progress, liberal progress. This is a constituent element of the imaginary of what is black. So regardless if you or if people agree or not, this accumulation has an ontological source. That is the West is not able to think outside of its ontological fundamentals and this puts into place not only the liberal tradition of abolitionism but also the way we have built our speeches about raciality uh, class 
and it shows slavery as a practice that has morphed into something different, but that is still present in the political imagina imaginariums. So regardless of each of these moments and how close or how away you feel from this, the thing is that this is part of the symptoms of the depletion of political modernity. They show the limits of our modern imaginarium uh, of the Western model, a modernity that could be universal under the logic of expansion of the Western rationality, the expansion of, ca of capitalism. Now, in this horizon, of course, what has radically been transformed is the relationship between theory and practice. How do we imagine the world? And the problem that we have right now is, and it's a more of a political thing, is that we have a political tradition, and not just a political, a right-wing tra tra political tradition that it's horrible, that it's moving towards uh, fascism, chauvinism, anti-feminism, and it's part of the central uh, topics uh, of the contemporary conversation. You no, know, we're talking about neo fascism. This is not um, ready for the transformation. It keeps thinking of it under the figure of progress. So, going against this uh, critical impotence, I would dare to go a little further and say. Uh, this is when reimagining the commons or recommoning uh, becomes fundamental. Why? Because one of the vehicles, one of the catalysts that can articulate uh, theory and practice is the university. Professional university, Napoleonic university, uh, university as a Humboldt, from a Humboldt uh, point of view, which is the, the, the main tradition in Latin America, but the point is university as a mediation between state and the public was historically structured from uh, two cultures. That is what the Germans called in the 19th century, the sciences of the spirit and the sciences of nature. And what we call, when, when we read the, this, the, the critics of Foucault, those who work uh, in, in the United States, human sciences is equal to, uh, uh, well, uh, like human scientificism, which is not the same. So this implies the need to rethink university, not, not just the university itself, that the practices, intellectual practices that happen within the university. And right now, I'm not uh, saying something that just uh, came to my mind out of the blue. I'm talking about the infinite co uh, situations that are happening all around in universities. And one of them is happening in those intellectual practices that uh, away from this Marcusian thesis of the technology and the homologation between uh, technology and nomination, uh, we create the original condition of technicality, the constituent element of technicity. At the same time, I am really interested in emphasizing this figure of technicity, technicity understood as mediation, an inescapable mediation of the experience, which is something different from the uh, experience or the phenomenological access to things that was present during the 19th century. In this case, we're talking about the fields of work that are uh, related to, to the experience of the university. It means the use of the apparatus, what the Les and Watari would call a cop, uh, that, that break. Uh, with a coupling, which is bringing together subjectivity. And well, this is the horizon where Spinoza uh, and his uh, thoughts about the, well, the power, the possibilities, trans-individualism in the French 
uh, I mean, I, Gilbert Simondon, his way of thinking has re-emerged, I mean, regardless of what uh, Simondon has uh, said about the technique, uh, trans individuality uh, has become central. Now, why bringing all of this? Because I think university cannot remain in its traditional role. The modern uh, project of university, it's depleted. The university is, uh, it, it no longer represents the public space of deliberation. And here, just to finish, I would like to make some specificities that could allow a dialogue with the new ways of uh, culture of the of the cities. I would like to to show that uh, dirty communism has to do with the experience of the common as a previous and fundamental experience uh, of creation. Communism in history appeared as an instance that needs to be conquered through the revolution. Dirty communism comes from a thesis that we could identify in Rancière and has to do with a communism from intelligence. Dirty communism suspends or supremes the reinstallation of the difference between avant-garde and people. This is something that's always in the process of expropriation, but at the same time of reappropriation in the case of the cities. Now, thinking about 17 and the new critical discourse, interrogate or question the homologation between the public and uh, the common. We need to be more precise. In the creating of Laban and Dardot, or I mean, good criticism towards neoliberalism, it is emphasized the need to oppose the moment of neoliberal privatization, the of expropriation, of uh, which be characterized as a moment of appropriation and reposition. But for them, in an European point of view, this opposition towards uh, occupation has to go through getting back the, the state in a democratic way. So from the point of view of Latin America, but I'm sure it's not just Latin America, I think it could be the same thing in Europe, the state rather than represent the possibility of a common, of a regulated common, the state has become a dispositive uh, a dispositive in, uh, uh, from a point of view of, of, of Foucaultian that has to do with uh, control and more governmental. There is a dispositive of govern governmentability of organization of the bodies. This allows to put into place the homologation between the public and uh, what, what's not public. So by questioning this, uh, homologation between the public and the common. I'm not saying government is secondary. I'm saying that in the map of the contemporary fight, rather than getting back the state or bringing or getting back the the government, is we need to get back the common as an organization. You know, bringing together communism, common, community, communality, you know, all of this as part of the semi semantics, but it's restitute the practices of the common, what Thompson would call the moral economy of the multitude, the moral economy of, of, of the commons. This is, I mean, the state is not a fundamental condition, it's just one condition among other conditions. So I think that would be a, an important element. The series of governments that are moving towards the left with the rhetorics anti-liberalist, anti-liberalist rhetorics that were in charge of the historical uh, destiny uh, in, in Latin America assignation of, uh, well, uh, of rights ended up being a disappropriation of the commons 
from a performance of a, of a government that didn't think of of its own uh, possibility of ending which obviously led to uh, movements of the right wing to come back and take the place again and they uh, again uh, exercising ultra neoliberal movements in Latin America for over the last seven years, which means uh, suffering, devastation that go beyond the classical uh, tactics of neoliberalism. So this would be like a neoliberalism of third order. We first had a neoliberalism of, of first order with uh, dictatorships, a second order, uh, fascism with well, with fascism along with the with the state state understood as a as an apparatus of contention and this third order neoliberalism so in this horizon i am just trying to set the stage and in this horizon i think that in theoretical point from a theoretical point of view this will be uh, the technologies of memory, the debate about how to create archives, the idea of official archive. And on that regard, I will be interested in thinking about revolt and city with the interruption of traffics organized by the, by the power like suppressing the timing of uh, globalization that is creating an interruption to think about the commons. But I think this is happening through a series of processes. There's a group of people working, a number of people thinking about it. So we're trying to create common places. So it's important to have the, the uh, there was a series of projects on the presentation of Gary, open scholarship, public scholarship. I think those categories are the ones that we need to pay attention to. We need to think of them in a rigorous way and in a specific context. And considering that we are in a context that's dominated by the saturation on the media, politics is just a, a show there is no possibility of a discussion about the commons because the common has become a narcissistic debates of political figures on the media. So what does it mean to think about the critical condition, the intellectual discussion, but open to the public in the, con in the context of past truth? And how can we develop a new semiology for the world? And this would restitute the, the questions that were yesterday made by Benjamin and our psychoanalyst friend, but I, I can recall his name, about how to think uh, 17 as a past university or as a university without condition. I think that the university is uh, it's not fundamental. I mean, it could be substituted by other processes and university is not exactly there. So, well, this will be my intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio, and thanks for, for stating all of these questions at, at, in the end, because that could help us open the discussion. I don't know, Gary, if you would like to say uh, something or Sergio, if you, if you would like to say something about well, the presentation of Gary, and then we could open up to the questions of the people here at Zoom, or but also on YouTube. Okay, I can go first. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was uh, huge. Uh, loads of loads of things in there. I mean, yeah, I agree. I agree with all that. That's, uh, uh, but that leaves us, yeah. At least it's with a challenge, doesn't it? That's uh, that's the difficult thing. Um, I guess what I'm interested in is, you know, we, we, starting from that point where where you left us off, uh, and just being very wary of. You know, you talked about you know the need to, I think, move out from modernity, um, and those kind of. Well, I capitalize in terms of Euro-Western modes of thought, and we need to think something else. 
Uh, and I'm just kind of struck how often we slip back into some of those categories uh, and how we how was meant to deal with that. So, you know, even notions like the public, we still hang on to the public. And yet Beatrice started by talking about 17 and talking about, well, 17 doesn't have physical space after the pandemic and people are working and running uh, an institution such as uh, 17 from their own homes. Uh, and for me, that's really interesting and maybe takes us potentially somewhere new. So you can have all the, the crisis, the exhaustion you're talking about, um, but it still opens up a chance for developing something new. For example, what's interesting about that is, well, what are the spaces that the people that are running 17, uh, what, how do we classify those spaces? Are they public? Are they private? Increasingly, people are using their laptops in very private spaces, not just in their own homes, in their own living rooms, like I'm doing now, but, you know, in their own beds. Um, what's his name? Elon Musk talking about most of the time when he's tweeting, he's on the toilet. It's kind of this strange notion of uh, uh, so public and private don't seem to be holding anymore. We seem to be moving out of that. Uh, think of that in terms of the Gutenberg, I like that very modern notion, which, you know, all our notions of um, public private seems one of the, the central notions of how we understand ourselves as human individuals in terms of societies. Uh, and obviously, there's a big push back uh, against that. There's a big Europe point coming in and having the right to privacy, the right to be forgotten against Google. Uh, you even got uh, Putin in, in the war thinking that he's going to control uh, people in Russia's access to the internet and Facebook. And he's going to, he seemed to be going to like, you know, mid 20th century propaganda techniques. Like you can control the media now in the way that you could then, which seems very nostalgic and, and uh, strange. But what you seem to be pushing us to is those kind of possibilities. And so, what I'd be interested in is how useful a notion like the public still is for that, and even how useful a notion like commons and communism is, because then the certain Latin Americanist thinkers would say, well, we, you know, even that's, they're kind of tired, even those are exhausted, maybe, maybe their time has come, maybe we need to think of something else, um, and I'm just wondering what that would be and how we could make that kind of shift and that manoeuvre, but that's that's all very difficult. Yes, Gary, I totally agree on that emphasis that you were uh, mentioning. I think that maybe we should emphasize uh, against the end of history of academic nihilism, the common is always taking place. There's always a series of practices taking place. And maybe the lack of imagination of the uh, university tradition has uh, pulled us back from actually entering those movements. That's why I like the word enthusiasm. Uh, and I love the list of projects that, uh, I mean, for us in, in, in Latin America or Latin Americans, it has always been like that. University in Latin America is not the same as the university in the United States that is kind of isolated. Uh, university is always like outside in the world. And, and as we were saying in before, um, Borges never thought about his fables uh, in the private library. He always thought uh, his fables moving around the, the people. So I think it's a matter of reimagining these new concepts. On that regard, I don't identify myself with the figure of the commons of the communality as it's circulating right now. But I think it's not possible to just uh, get rid of the commons on its ontological uh, possibilities of this singular plural subject. I mean, after the debate of uh, community with Bataille, Esposito, et cetera, with Blanchot, I think also that one of the interesting things that we should think of 
is, uh, and that it's also present in 17, is the possibility of thinking the common in a material way, not ethnic, ethnically, not na from nationalism or an ident from an identitarianism. It's thinking it uh, from maybe mutuality, from, uh, from a managerial point of view, so to speak, against the absolute privatization of the academic practice in the logic of indexation, of uh, academic, of the, the index of impact or the ratio of impact uh, that was the, the, the model, just uh, as you, although with less practice, I am very uh, aware. I mean, yesterday there was a, an amazing uh, panel about migration and justice. And although this is something that comes back in the history of Latin America and the history of capital, because capitalism has, uh, as part of its history, the displacement of a lot of people. All the intellectuals that work with the follow-up of victims was amazing because it was stating a phenomenology of the destruction related to, I mean, in, in terms of migration. And while doing that, they were stating the need of the concept of a transnational, I would even dare to say a post-national concept of justice, because the modern sovereign idea of, of justice is not enough now that migration is such a, a global phenomenon. So we're now opening up to this kind of practices. We are imagining new ways that could complement the formal way of thinking uh, uh, in the universities. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, Benjamin is raising his hand. And after Benjamin, uh, Gabriela, uh, with a, and also if you have questions, uh, those who are here in Zoom, just raise your, your hands and open your mic. So uh, go ahead, Benjamin. Thank you. Uh, I am amazed and I'm super excited while listening to both of you. And I wanted to raise my hand and take the floor because I try, maybe not adding, but clarifying a framework, an additional framework to this uh, conversation. Although it's maybe not additional because it's uh, at play with many things that you have both mentioned. Your point, Sergio, about the relationship between the public and the common is crucial, I think. And it goes through the question of 17. I'm going to explain a little bit more about it. And all the topics that Gary has stated and what he has worked for so long. I will, in this colloquium, I have described publicly what we are trying to do with the Institute. That is, and I opened this up because it's sort of like, a, a, like it's the, um, it's my thinking, but it's like the state of the art of my way of thinking. This mutuality that we're trying to build as sort of as a participative business of public interest. And what I said is, I confess that up to now, I'm more convinced with the entrepreneurial formats other than cooperative formats, because I think that they are more sophisticated considering the capitalist uh, inventive. And partic participative refers that, well, maybe the actions could be in the hands of those who are uh, at play uh, on that business uh, as well as others, but others that are not there as maybe uh, partners or with expectations of receiving uh, the returns, like just participating on the social mission of the business. And of public interest, because in, in this regard that you have the, uh, divided the public from the private, that is, 
It is quite complex. Our situation in Latin America is quite complex because it's as if in order to take care of the public, we need to move away from the governmental sphere. And the question is, where, where the hell do we go? This is the big question. I would like to bring the reference, uh, a very explicit reference that has to do with Andres Gordillo. It has to do with of Max Weber in 1910, where he was talking about the need of independence of the university from in the in university needs to be independent from the market, from the government, from the corporation funds that are state or market interest disguised uh, as something else. In order to put a cable from here to what Gary shared, I'm always quite impressed uh, by his uh, interventions. Gary, I think it will be important and I would love that your group could be directly involved in the economic topics because today we are discussing the horizon of uh, cryptocurrencies that, I mean, they had a fall down very recently. I would say that cryptocurrencies are a very good example of something that could have been interesting from the point of view of common interest without being completely public and not necessarily becoming private, although it, that's how it's uh, been done. But among many things that can be thought of or that can be said about cryptocurrencies is that they can be useful for mafia, for uh, from illegal groups, because they are constituted from the anonymous point of view. And that makes of them a vehicle to an accumulation of savage accumulation of capital. On some sense, I'm trying to think that what we need to find is something similar to cryptocurrency but at the same time being completely opposite to cryptocurrencies. And it will be amazing to, to work on a network, on a big network, to find answers that could be transversal to a lot of initiatives. I think that it's, it's sort of like a call out, a very substantial uh, call out for, for this specific thing I, I'm thinking about. I think that uh, it brings together our thoughts. I mean, I'm now bringing it together with the moment we are now living it's in 17. We are at the brink of formulating how this mutual uh, thing in uh, that we have how are we going to make it work how are we going to make this uh, connected with all of these concepts that you have brought to to the discussion well to the conversation thank you benjamin uh, gabriela and then i have a question here of paula sarate if you could talk after gabriela uh, Thank you. Uh, my, my petition. My mic is, is open. Well, well, it's the question if Sergio could uh, go deeper about the notions of the public and the community uh, and the common. Well, I will try to answer Gabriela because it's a very deep topic. What I'm trying to say is that the concept, the modern concept of publicity is heterogeneous. It's not just uh, the same the public cashier than the often pleased writer 
or uh, even Raun uh, of, of German, the public space imagined. And from the point of view in uh, from Latin America, I am interested on in what we could call, uh, well, to show how Latin America moved to uh, an homologation on the public. It's an homologation. Of course, this is not necessary. There are different instances of public culture that are not state uh, driven, like in uh, the proletary night, uh, uh, like uh, Ranciere or uh, Chartier. But for people in Latin America, funding or creating the state and the state was fundamental. The state uh, completes a performative function, uh, I mean, against the, the, the classic point of view. In Latin America, uh, we could notice a different operation. It's the state, the one who creates the nation. Latin America is a place where we had independence revolutions that came together with the creation of the nations that were going to be emancipated. So this uh, paradox has uh, led us to the place where uh, the governments or the states are part or a necessary or a fundamental part to the creation of nations. This is from the 19th century, but with all the, everything has to do with transculturation of the 20th century. So it's the need of thinking the common beyond the public state space in Latin America. And for that, we need to do something different. We need to create a genealogy of the natural practices that have created notions of the common, but that cannot be, uh, or, or that cannot depend. That's why I'm interested in um, political movements that are not reducted to uh, identities, because in Latin America, in, in during the 20th century, it was populist, ethno-nationalist movements in, in the case of Brazil, Mexico, and in different places of Latin America that they presented themselves as a national uh, possibilities. So in, in terms of identification of, of ethno-identities, uh, in Chile with the affluence of people from Haiti, the self-representation of a Chilean people, I mean, just to give some examples. So there's a lot of work to do. We still need to make some genealogy uh, analysis and new ways of imagining the commons because these are not just theoretical things. These are happening at the level of uh, interactions. On that regard, Benjamin, there is a tradition, a romantic tradition, uh, corporativist. What's at play is the uh, politic or the economic political economy of 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 violence. I mean, there is violence. I think that Gabriela and what I'm interested in thinking of is thinking about a concept of institution or dirty institutional practices, dirty, in, what I mean as a technological process. Institutions need to be a process of the commons. And the current constituent assembly in Chile that is first for the first time imagining a constitution that's produced from the social movements and not from the, those who are experts. And yes, as a constitution, as a text, is it's not viable, it's not feasible, but at the same time, it's a process and it's a bringing into the material world a series of practices of collaboration. So I'm not against the, the law. I was, uh, this creation of this constitution is not a movement against the law. It's actually bringing the... the bringing this into the this uh, realm. Paula, go ahead. Hello, Sergio. I am from, I'm saying hi from, from Chile. I'm doing my uh, PhD studies in 17. 
and within my investigation within my research i'm interested on the spinoza thought uh but also from the the Lewis. and it's interesting for me this three elements that you were uh mentioning uh, and making a criticism to everything that has to do with this uh, crisis that we are now living on and you were saying at some point that we brought together the Spinozian thought of, of uh, potential. I don't know if you could say a little bit more about it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your uh, question. I, <laughs> I noticed that you were Chilean because of your accent. Well, talking about uh, Spinoza, with the less uh, problem of uh, expression but to bring this to break this down in a very simple way spinoza is uh, so, somehow relevant although my i mean my connection with philosophy is not from the university so i'm not interested in creating a hierarchy where the author can regulate and legislate what you can do with your with his uh, with his work. I'm a little bit more of an anarchist in terms that I don't believe in that archaic of the author. So moving beyond the, the work of Spinoza and the problem, I would recommend Cecilia, Cecilia Abdo Ferez, which is called, uh, well, Crime, the Confrontation of the Individual with, uh, with Early Modernity. She analyzes the pre-assumptions of neoliberalism, of property, guilt that are on the base of the of education, slavery that are part of modernity uh, and, and that were at play during the colonization of Latin America. So she was kind of um, deconstructing all this concept, all the concepts that were instrumental why showing material practices of, uh, of of control so in a from a practical point of view she's doing a, a critic uh, to the spinozian point of view to this uh possessive individualism which is a predominant on the uh, English capitalism. So I would say that rather than just sending you to read Spinoza, I would place this uh, book of Cecilia Abdoferes because that will be a productive use. It will also be an abuse, but uh, I mean, we could use this, uh, this book as a way of uh, having a different way of, of, of accessing. I think it has to do with bringing back trans individual because that's a way of reading conatus and the affectation of this potential or this power that, that comes from spinoza and it reappears in a different way on the re-elaboration of the problem of trans individuality as an alternative to the liberal concept of the citizen but also the philosophical concept of the subject and it comes on the work of simon don and it's quite important right now uh, a, a book that's called Anarcha Feminism, not Anarcho, Anarcha Feminism. It's a book in, in Spanish, Italian. And this book shows the necessity that feminism cannot be uh, okay with just a, a, a politics of from women to women. It has a, an anarchist potential. So there's no end without patriarchalism if there is no end with oppression in general so it's not just the problem of women as a subject there is a new kind of corpus that has to do with a trans individual so we get rid of the public of the communality we move towards the need of thinking of new ways 
these new ways of subjectivity in terms of the lesson watery. Thanks for the conferences. Thanks for the conferences. They were amazing. And I was, this is a question for, for Gary or a question, a, a, a comment. In 17, we are intensely thinking about the notion of critical management of culture. So I would, I mean, I'm interested in this way of thinking, a new way of inhabiting public places from the coexistence of initiatives, of management uh, initiatives that bring an, a critical alternative in the ways of living the present. I believe that, well, I wish you could talk a little bit more about this potential possibility of coexistence or co-inhabiting the city or the, or the space. Yeah, uh, sure. It, it kind of starts from some of the things that Ben Humin was, was talking about, where he finds uh, entrepreneurialism very uh, productive and very interesting. And I understand. I and mean, we've had, uh, he and I have had long conversations about it. Uh, in in the, the UK context, and from a left wing point of view, entrepreneurialism is, has, has a little bit of a, of a, a dirty word. Um, you know, where the business is seen as the problem and the public realm is seen as more on the side of the angels. I don't think that that's quite true. I think they're both um, parts of the same coin, if you like. And what we're talking about and what we seem to be uh, pushing towards is stepping out of, of either, either side of that. Um, I'm doing it by negotiating between the public and entrepreneurialism as well. I mean, you know, something like Open Humanities Press is a business. It's a strange kind of business. It gives its products away. It's not really about making profit, um, but it's still out there in the public realm, trying to manage, uh, trying to manage things uh, in a in the kind of critical way that you're talking about. Um, Seventeen's doing it in a different context um, and still trying to push it those those boundaries, those limits that we're talking about, those limits of, of uh, modernity. And I think we can use this moment, we've talked about it as a moment of crisis. Um, I think even, you know, there are versions of, of neoliberalism. Uh, we've got one in the UK at the minute that really likes this crisis and doesn't see it as, as a negative crisis. They think if they get rid of the old rules, Britain runs on um, some public rules and then there's some other rules that are unspoken. But if you're a kind of a good chap, if you're a decent person, that you abide by them. What we're seeing in our government at the moment is they don't abide by those rules. And we're seeing what happens when you don't do that. And they see that as another means to make profit. Uh, but I think Sergio was right in saying, you know, even war, even Putin is seeing all this as another means to, to make profit. And guess what I'm interested in is uh, we're trying to we're trying to yeah we're trying to shift away from this uh, the liberal or neoliberal and we've done it starting with uh, academia because we see institutions like ours our centre like seventeen as they create a space where we can do this there's not that many spaces in society in the public realm where you can can do it maybe art is one. Um, but the university is another space where you can make these some of these experiments and try to think beyond these modernists. We would, I would think of them uh, under the influence of thinkers, some from Latin America, as Euro Western. These concepts, how can we think beyond them? I, I'm not sure I would use uh, trans individualism. I'm kind of interested in the individuality of, of people like uh, Luther Blissett, which were kind of anonymous Italian. Uh, collective, and they're talking about that as individualism being the product of the correlation between the singular and the plural. I'm kind of interested in, in, in that. But what I'm trying to do is have a series of experiments uh, in the public realm where you can think through some of these things. So we've had 
experiments around with piracy. We've had them around notions of authorship or the fixity of texts. And we're now working with art galleries and museums and other institutions to see if we can, and we can do that in the more uh, public space. So it's just taking all the things that 17 is associated with, that it's teaching, that it's thinking about, and moving them into the public sphere. I'm not sure we need to talk a little bit more about things like or well, crypto and NFT and NFTs and all those kind of things. Uh, Benjamin was talking about them as in they've been taken over by, I don't know, the right or by fascists or by um, negative forces. I mean, I'm not sure about that, that kind of view of technology. I do understand it. Um, but, you know, writing books, people have produced bad books, right wing books, fascist books. I don't think a technology has an essence. So if we wanted to experiment with some of the, those things, perhaps one thing is we have to build an, an alternative version of crypto. Uh, but maybe we can use what's already is there and just take it in, in different directions. I think the way that politics works, the way that capitalism works is it sees something happening. I always think of we're going through a moment a bit like we did uh, 10 or 15 years ago around peer-to-peer. -peer. So we had peer-to-peer, -peer, we had things like Nap Napster, we had all this making media free and openly available, and capitalism comes along and it invents social media, it invents Facebook, it invents YouTube, and the interfaces are so much easier, and it closes that down. It makes it much more into what we recognizable as pretty standard uh, businesses in many respects. And that's happening around crypto, that's happening around NFTs, it's happening around AI and all those things. That doesn't mean that they're in, they have some sort of essence that is just capitalist. Maybe we, our job is to experiment with them and try and uh, mutate them into something interesting. Um, and that's what I see us is doing. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has a question. I would like to. I would like to take the time. It's a question for for both of you that resonates from. I mean, from the beginning, from a presentation of Gary. I will try to be clear, but uh, what I was thinking is the situation that the world is living in this kind of moving back, moving backwards in our countries, but at the same time, this moving forward in terms of the elaboration of the constitution of Chile. Yesterday, in the in, when we were talking about health, the panel of health, she's in the UK, and she was telling us that the problem of the health system is that there was uh, not enough staff, that there were uh, like 130,000 sp uh, spots uh, for uh, people, for, well, for, for health workers, but there were not enough people in the UK to fill those uh, spots and they were not accepting migrants to fill those spots. So the thing is, well, that's on one hand on the UK, but I was thinking, Sergio, on all the problems that we have with the laws against abortion and uh, violence and buying and selling guns in the United States, what could the institutions, what can institutions such as 17 do or state in terms that we, that could let us to think conceptually, but also practically this, this critical thinking. I mean, if before we could say that anything could be critical or anything could be conceptualized as critical, right now, what would be critical? What is, what is, the, what will be the role of 17 in this future that we are now seeing or that it's now coming closer? What's the, what will be the role of uh, an institution such as 17? Uh, Gary, uh, should I go first and then to close? Gary would like to go first and then uh, Sergio could close. Okay. Uh, okay, we can do that. So, uh, yeah, you're talking about 
there's not enough people in the National Health Service in the UK after Brexit, after we made it difficult for people from other parts of the world to actually stay in the country. Um, so, yeah, we are experiencing um, a crisis. We're experiencing a numerous crises. We're experiencing a crisis as a result of Brexit, which is making goods hard to, to arrive. Uh, People don't want to deal with us uh, anymore because of the paperwork and the regulations. And so we're experiencing that. We're experiencing a cost of living crisis. Some people attribute it to the war in Ukraine and uh, the issues that other people are just attributing to profiteering. People, gas companies, electricity companies have seen this as a chance to raise prices. So they have done. So we are uh, experiencing um, all these crises. The question is, Yes, which direction is it going to is it going to take us in? Um, are we are we going to just uh, you know wait for someone like the uh, a version of the Labour Party, which is neoliberal at the moment? Is it just going to come on and come and manage that and trying to take us through that in a in a in a kind of safe way? So you know we're, we're experiencing the crisis uh, less harshly, um, or do we? And this gets us into the role of, of, of 17. Um, is this a critical point? Is this a moment of change? One of the one of the left histories of, of Thatcherism and neoliberalism in the UK would be that uh, that that revolution, that neoliberal revolution of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, that was prepared for a long time before the 1970s and 1980s. There were people thinking, Chicago School and other places, they were thinking and preparing. So they had the philosophies and they had the worked out. And I think it's a Milton, Milton uh, Friedman quote. You, you just need to, you're waiting for the crisis and you're waiting for the correct crisis where your ideas will then be accepted. Uh, so one idea of what 17 could do, uh, what we can all do that would be critical in that sense, that critical of a really vital, really important, as well as critical as in uh, engaging in critique, would be to prepare for that, prepare for that moment when a new language, a new philosophy, a new system of thinking, acting, being, working, uh, when that's when the moment has come where there's a party, like I'm hoping that the Labour Party, I'm hoping someone like Andy Burnham, the mayor of Manchester, he's got lots of interesting ideas that are very different from the current Labour Party, that they will be needing those ideas and they can then have a chance to, um, to be critical, to be right important, to move us to this, the, this other place that is neither of the two options we've seen. So that would be the the important critical role that 17 could play, obviously not in a UK context necessarily, although some of your ideas filtered through me and other people uh, and things, but you know, you, there'll be some similar things happening in different places around the world. That's our job. Our, that's what we're doing here. We're discussing these ideas. We're trying to uh, speculate on them. We're trying to be open to them, um, to move us away and not, so we're not just feeling this, uh, this melancholy, this, this sense of uh, everything's falling apart, um, but how can we move, how can we use that as a moment, um, a very critical moment of transition? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with the general tone and the emphasis uh, of, of Gary. I would say, or I think, that it's providing strength to these uh, spaces of contamination. And I use the spaces of contamination in making this, uh, making a relationship with this dirty communism. On one hand, yes, we need new ways of thinking, new imaginariums, but we're not the architects of these imaginariums. I, I wouldn't dare to, to be on the place of, of, of the philosophers in a transcendental point of view. These imaginariums are always uh, occurring, are always being built. So I guess that this figure or this idea of contamination could be central. I think that uh, about this uh, old uh, theater play of Bertolt Brecht, 
uh, one of my PhD students, he's uh, studying uh, the topic of science and the people. He's also a very renowned uh, physicist. Well, he studied physics. And he was uh, reading this uh, play that's called uh, Life of Galileo from Bertolt Brecht or Galileo traitor or hero. And the figure of Galileo, uh, this scientist that, re uh, that made the revolution on the modernity, but on the other hand, the one that renounced to his beliefs and becomes subject of the Inquisition. And what Brecht shows is that radicality of Galileo is not in either revolutionizing or, uh, or, or being a traitor to his uh, what he does is he created sort of a contagion of thinking that will create a, a different way of thinking. So the author Galileo or his heroicism is not relevant. The point is the, the contagion, the contamination, because this happens with scientific speeches, with sci technological discourse, with artistic discourse. These discourses are always taking place. And what we need is making of 17 a place of, of contamination, of dissemination that could uh, make a little bit uh, dirty I mean, this openness implies a sort of uh, a bet uh, an economical bet which is something that we were talking about when we were talking or when we were talking about uh, the economical part of this other than that the rest of it is just speculation because history is always happening <laughs> regardless of us uh, we just need to open up to what is always happening we're about to close, but uh, Gary, I don't know if you could read the question of, well, the comment of Benjamin in the chat of Zoom. Were we there? Uh, yeah, I've already replied. I know, I know, I know. I'm just, uh, but yeah, it's such a project would be, uh, yeah, interesting for those to build, a, to build on those. Yes, that would be very intriguing. Uh, I think Benjamin is suggesting a project of, of, of cases that would move outside the public and the private. Um, that kind of classical modern sense. Can we build up uh, such projects? No, that would be that would be an intriguing thing to do. And it would be interesting to see what what issues it also it also raised. And yeah, and I suppose I think of institutions like this, and, and, and I know what, what, what's just been said, but it's it's you know I think of it. It's a bit like artists. Artists kind of are experimenting with open with the future. But I just don't think we can leave it to artists. There's lots of positive things about art, but it, there's certain limitations, not least. It's it's a socially designated sphere where you're meant to do these experimental things. Uh, and that's great, but there can be something like safety valve atmosphere about that. What's exciting is taking this work into other areas where it's not supposed to be. And so doing it in an entrepreneurial sphere is, is incredibly exciting, I think. Um, it's that I'm kind of challenging. I mean, I'm, I'm, some of my best friends are artists. I love artists. I work with artists. But you know, doing it in art, doing it in art sphere is yeah, okay. That's what you're meant to do. Doing it in an entrepreneurial or a business sphere, okay, that's that's something very different. Doing it in critical management, that's amazing. I mean, trying to work through those, having the same sensibility. What we're talking about in in, in terms of you know Brecht and Galileo, that kind of that opening up of that kind of space, that's, that's so exciting to me. Thank you, Gary. Well, we have to close. We are almost done. I want, of course, to thank you, Gary and Sergio. Sergio, of course, we're going to, we will continue with this process of contamination through the colloquium. And I hope that, I hope you can give us a, a I don't know, like sort of a sneak peek of how to do it or so. Uh, we're going to, to close, uh, of course, uh, thanking, uh, well, the, the, the interpreter, because, uh, well, interpreting Sergio is like a <laughs> complicated. So, 
And well, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Sergio. And thanks to all the people who are here who were helping us on the technical uh, part, Salome. And thank you so much. We'll see you after lunch to continue with the colloquium. Thank you so much and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.